We are going to pray before we get into this morning's sermon. All right. Lord, we pray that um, you would just give us ears to, to hear, Lord. Give us hearts to receive. Um, Lord, just open our hearts to what you have to say, Jesus. And we just invite your Holy Spirit in to uh, talk to us this morning. So we thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. So good. Hey, we've got a rule here in this sermon. If you hear anything, anything that you like, anything that I hear, you can say preach it. You can say amen. You can say God is good. You can say holla at your boy. Um, whatever you would like. Who, who brought a paper bubble this morning? <laughs> who brought a paper bubble this morning? One person. That is so awesome. Man, I really miss those things. Okay, we're going to turn to John 21, verses 15. Amen. Amen. That's what I say. Okay, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to me, him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So for some of you this morning, you're probably sitting here wondering why. Why would Jesus, son of God, ask Peter, a man, if he loves him three times. Jesus isn't deaf. Jesus is not insecure about whether Peter loves him. So what could it be? See, the, this morning's topic is the God who restores. Now, God does not only restore us to himself, but he also restores us to others. And to, this morning, we're going to go on the journey of how Peter uh, is restored to Jesus. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So, Peter come, Jesus comes to Peter and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Amen. It was a quiet amen. And see, what Peter was trying to do, uh, Jesus was trying to do here is this. He was actually trying to humble Peter. See, if you get a bit of an understanding about Peter, Peter was a very, very religious uh, and uh, I guess what you could say, he, he wore a mask. He wore a religious mask wherever he went. You see, Peter was kind of like that kid in class who is the teacher's pet. And you know what I'm, what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, that's my neighbor. Um, no. See, he was the teacher's pet. He was that kid, really nice around the teacher, really lovely, always on his best behavior. But when he wasn't with the teacher, as soon as the teacher left, he would say, hey, be careful. I know the teacher. Be good to me. I know the teacher incredibly, incredibly religious. And you know, the thing that exposes him the most was actually when Jesus went to the cross. See, when Jesus went to the cross, before that, Jesus had actually said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, Peter denied him three times. To make matters worse, he even rejected the disciples because he knew there was a chance that they might get killed. And if he was caught knowing them, he could get killed as well. He saved his own skin. He was totally and completely selfish, yet would never admit to the fact that he was never loving Jesus all the time. See, he thought he was perfect, good enough. He thought he was his own savior. Where Jesus was supposed to be was where Peter put himself. But Peter's actions exposed him. And see, this is why Jesus comes to Peter and asks him three times, do you love me? He's saying, do you, do you, would you put me first? Would you die for me? Would you love me eternally? Peter says, and the funny thing about that, he's in the, even though he says, I'll love you, the word difference that Jesus uses compared to Peter uses is actually different. So when Jesus uses the word love, he uses this Greek word called agape. Everyone say agape. 
And agape is this unconditional, forever loving, divine love. It never ends, it never stops, it keeps on going, right? But Peter responds to him with a word, not agape, but the word paideia. Everyone say paideia. And paideia is kind of a, uh, a, a, like a brotherly love. It's a brotherly love. It's not an eternal love, a forever love. And you see, this is what he was trying to grasp. This is what I was trying to help him. saying, Peter, Peter, if I'm going to restore you, you have to take yourself out of being savior and you have to put me there. See, it was only when Peter realized that he couldn't love Jesus eternally and offered Jesus what was actually in his hand is when Jesus could restore him. When he is going to humble himself before Jesus, realize who he really was, was, that's when Jesus could make him something great. That's when Jesus could restore Peter to himself. See, Jesus always, this is the powerful thing about Jesus, he always wanted friendship with Peter, always wanted friendship. See, there's a really, if you read uh, earlier on in the chapter, um, Jesus meets the disciples on the beach and he says, children, he calls them children. Now, it's a really, really weird word because it doesn't actually, Jesus isn't actually saying children, but he's actually using a colloquial slang language. So for example, if you were maybe English, it would be like Jesus coming up to them and saying, lads. Or if you're Australian, it'd be like coming up to them and saying, boys, the boys, you know, what's going on, boys? And we think, oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. But it's actually a radically personal term. Actually, what he's saying is this. When he uses that word, what he's saying is we are so close, we are so intimate, and that we are such good friends, and I still love you. That's what he's trying to get across. He still desires friendship with them, even though he rejected him on the cross. Even though Jesus' most hour of need, he still was there. He still wanted friendship with him the whole entire time. And that's the powerful thing about it. Jesus is always our true friend. And yet when we talk about being restored, the second thing is to remember that if we are restored to Jesus, then we are to be restored to others. Everyone say restored to others. Oh, you've got to say it loud on that. Come on. Yeah, so good. So if you notice in this other text, every time Peter says, uh, yes, Lord, I love you, Jesus is after him. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Or feed my lambs, sorry. Now, what does that mean? Why, do, why would Jesus even use sheep in the first place? See, sheep, oftentimes, when we talk about in pastoral terms, pastors are meant to be shepherds, right? They're supposed to shepherd people. But at this time, Peter didn't even have a church. So what, what is Jesus saying here? And what he's saying this, we're called to be a friend. We are called to be a friend to those who don't have friends. We're called to love the sheep. Hands up if you've ever seen a sheep up close in person. Have you ever tried to pat a sheep and they just walk away from you? And you're just like, wow, I feel so loved. You know? But you can see why Jesus uses the term sheep. Sheep, sheep are not pretty. I tell you that right now. They don't, they don't even give you affection. Like, they don't even show that they care about you. I remember in like year seven, I was at, on like a farm and at our school we have a farm and basically what was happening was the teacher thought it'd be a real funny prank. He's like, all right, who wants to feed the sheep? And I was like, yeah, I'm massive. I can feed any sheep. And then I was, so I went in with this massive feed bucket and like I had these like massive, huge sheep like charge at me with this food bucket. Teacher well knowing this would happen. It was a very humbling experience. Um, <laughs> I basically got rammed over and the teacher had to go over the gate and pull me out by the collar because I was getting like swamped by these sheep. The sheep didn't even care about me. They were just like, man, if he dies today, it's all good. I'm getting fed. So, <laughs> sheep are not pretty. Sheep are not loving or affectionate. And this is what Jesus is trying to get at. We're supposed to be friends with those who aren't necessarily nice to us people who aren't valued in society, people who um, maybe others see as annoying or others see as unwell, uh, just 
not valued at all. And this is what Jesus is trying to get across. He's saying, look, if you love me, if you truly love me, you say you love me, this is what you'll do. This is what you'll do. We're supposed to love those who are hard to love. See, I'm going to get Max up to help give a demonstration. Can we give Max a clap? So um, Max and I have been friends for a little while, but little did I know a little while, I I found out before we were friends, he used to hate me. Everyone say, ooh, ooh. Hey, can I get an amen? (laughs) Um, It's all good now, we're friends. But it was really funny at the start because I was just being friendly to him. I didn't really know much about him. And Max sent a very clear signal early on that he was not the biggest fan of me. You know, I'm like, like, I'm a very affectionate person, so I like to give people hugs. I'm for the boys, so, you know, give the boys a hug. But Max <laughs> made a very clear signal that early on. When I went to go give him a hug for, like, the first time, he was like, nah, I really don't like you. And this is what he did. Can you do a, a mad impersonation? Ha- yeah, Bieber. <laughs> this is what he did. So you, you're me, and I'm going to be Max. All right, let's go. Give me a hug. That's basically what he did. <laughs> Thanks, mate. You're a legend. Give him a hand round of applause. <laughs> Max was totally not impressed. And from that moment, I was like, do I, God, do I have to keep, like, you know, loving him? Like, do I have to? Like, is that, like, is that what your Bible even says? Like, no one really knows. But, like, and it was a very clear response. It was a yes. In fact, be friends with him. Be friends with him and enjoy his company. And needless to say, this man has like changed, not because of me, but, through, but Jesus working through me and his love. Max and I are now the greatest of friends. We have such a great time together. And see, that's the example of, Jesus, of what Jesus wants us to be. He wants to be friends with us. And he wants us to be friends with others. Now, I, where I work, I work at like a landscape yard. And um, I tell you what, these guys are much older than me. They're, you know, all in their 50s. So they're all about to retire, like Jason Ellsmore's age. Born, you know, around the time of the pyramids being built. <laughs> <laughs> the power of the microphone. Um, and I was struggling for ages. I was like, God, how do I love these guys? How do I get them to church? Like, it's hard because I'm young. I'm young. I'm only 19. They're 50. They've lived out most of their lives. And I'm young. You know, and I have a passion to see them come to Jesus one day. But it was just so difficult because they didn't want to hear it from a 19-year-old. They didn't want to hear Jesus loves them from a 19-year-old. It was the last thing they wanted to hear. They blow me off. I even asked one of them, hey, can I pray for you? And he was like, No. I was like, well, that's a pretty clear response. I'm not going to pursue that. (laughs) So you can imagine, I was pretty discouraged, right? And then this text, I was shaken when I read this. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Be friends with those who don't want to be friends with you. And especially at work, I kind of like just turn up, do my thing, leave. Wouldn't really talk to them. I was kind of like, you guys are old and about to die off, so I won't even bother with you guys. But... But this is the thing. I was so shaken when I read this and I was so convicted of what I was doing was wrong that I turned around and I purposely made an effort to be friends with them. See, as Christians, this is the thing. Christians should always be the ones going to the restaurant, picking up the tab, paying for their friends, right? When you go to the cinemas, pay for your friend's movie, right? Sit and listen to them. Ask them, how are you going? See, you know what? If you met a humble person, you wouldn't even know it. This is why a humble person is not someone who claims humility, but a humble person is someone who is so radically invested and interested in you. That's a humble person. That's someone who's truly feeding Jesus' sheep. See, we all have people in our lives. We all have people that um, annoy us, frustrate us, are not loyal to us, and are unfaithful, just like Peter was. See, the powerful thing about Peter was this, right? We can all relate to this. Peter's friendship was futile, he was unfaithful, he was totally self-seeking. And that's who Jesus 
was meant to be friends with the whole time. He never wavered in his faithfulness. That's who we're called to be friends with. See, a good friend is this. A good friend always lets you in and a good friend never lets you down. See, Jesus is totally transparent with us. You know, servants don't know what's going on with their masters. Servants never going on. But Jesus is totally transparent. He says, no, I'm going to let you in. I'm going to totally let you know what's going on. So good. See, are you vulnerable people? Do you let them in? Are you transparent? Or do you spin them? Do you spin situations? Do you manipulate? And do you close off? And a good friend never lets you down. Are you there for people? Peter was never there for Jesus. When Jesus needed him most, Peter left him. But you see, Jesus never left Peter. And he never leaves us this morning. Whether you're going through something, you feel like, I've walked away, I'm far, I'm distant. Well, Jesus has never left you. A good friend always lets you in, and a good friend never lets you down. You know, I remember reading this first, and I'm thinking, I'm a pretty good friend. I'm pretty, like, pastoral. I'm pretty good with people. But then I realized I would never, ever, ever, ever make that kind of sacrifice for anyone in my life. Never. I love it when I use my friendships for my own self-gain. I love it. Never give myself in that kind of way for others. And it shook me. See, Jesus, Jesus' ultimate act of friendship was going to the cross for us. See, this is the powerful thing. Jesus died so that you will never be rejected by God. He was the only one to be cast out of the presence by God. Only one. So that you didn't have to. He's the only one. He's the only friend you'll ever need, only friend that you always will need. See, this is the thing. To have the confidence to be able to be a friend with anyone, be hurt by anyone and not be shaken and not be wavered. You have to have a friend who is so high, a friend who is so just above you that gives you so much confidence, that gives you so much security. You would need a friend so unbelievably good that no matter what would happen, you would always have the confidence of knowing that you could go back to that friend. That friend will never let you down. That friend will never, ever hurt you. And that's Jesus for us. That's Jesus for us this morning. Can I get an amen? amen? So good. See, Jesus died so that he could be your ultimate friend, so that he could restore himself to you. That's a true friend. That's a true friend that we all need. Hey, I'm going to pray. I'm going to wrap this up. Bow your eyes. Lord, we thank you for everyone here this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are a true friend, that you'll never leave us. Lord, that uh, you'll always be by our side. Lord, I pray that that truth will just resonate in our hearts this morning. So we thank you for all that you're doing and all that you are. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Hey, can we thank Mads for sharing with us this morning? Thanks, guys.